Welcome to lesson three of module one, Cells as the Basis of Life. In this video, we're going to be looking at the cell membrane and the structure, which we refer to as the fluid mosaic um, kind of model of that membrane. Uh, so the inquiry question for this video is how do cells coordinate activities within their internal environment and external environment? And the cellular membrane is an important, a uh, very important way of doing that. There is quite a lot of meta language in this video, so I'll go through these words first. So we've got hydrophobic, and they're referred to as water hating. So they have a fear; those molecules have a fear of water. Uh, we talk about hydrophilic, uh, so they have an affiliation with water, so they're water loving. When we talk about active transport, we're talking about in a, um, transport which requires energy, and passive transport is when no energy is required for the transport of these mo of molecules. When we talk about diffusion, we're talking about um, the movement of any type of molecule from a region of high concentration to low concentration. When we talk about osmosis, we're talking specifically the movement of a solvent um, through a semi-permeable membrane. And when we refer to a concentration gradient, we're talking about the gradual change in the concentration of solutes present in a solution between two regions. When we talk about uh, the cellular structure, so just a quick refresh, um, we're talking specifically today about the cell membrane, um, and it plays an important role in regulating the flow of substances into and out of the cell. Um, by doing so, it helps maintain an environment within the cell that is different from the external environment. Um, but the cellular membrane is what we refer to as differentially or selectively permeable. So only substances, only certain substances can cross it. Uh, the structure of this cell membrane is about 40% lipid and 60% protein. So here we have a quick image of the fluid mosaic model um, and we can see that the circular shapes on the top of the diagram, um, if we were to look at it from above, it probably would look like um, a bit of a mosaic, so the like a tile mosaic um, and the fact that it's fluid means that it slightly moves and that things can pass through it. Uh, so this model was proposed by Singer and Nicholson in 1972, and um, it has what we call a bilayer of phospholipid molecules um, with other molecules such as proteins, carbohydrates, and cholesterol scattered through the bilayer. So we can see here bilayer, so we've got two layers, a layer on the top and a layer on the bottom, and we can see that the, um, the lipids are the little purple circles, and we can see that these other molecules um, which are scattered through it, so the blue and the yellow, are the different um, carbohydrates or the proteins. Um, which are scattered through that bilayer. Um, it is in fact impermeable to water soluble particles, ions and polar molecules. So it means that they cannot pass through it. Um, and the movement of these molecules into and out of the cell are controlled by the protein channels, which were the big blue molecules which we saw in that um, picture. The fluidity of the membrane allows individual phospholipid molecules to move about within the layers, um, and, but this fluidity, so the ability of these um, phospholipids to move, is affected by temperature, the presence of cholesterol, and the phospholipid composition and structure. So here we can see another little diagram here. Um, again, different colours, but same um, scattering of those proteins and carbohydrates, but also we can see that bilayer of phospholipids um, really clearly there. Uh, so the, some of the function of the cell membrane, um, so we can see the first one we can look at is the function of the proteins which are scattered through that cell membrane. So these proteins provide selective channels which allow water soluble particles uh, to travel through the cell membrane. Um, sometimes they catalyze reactions associated with the cell membrane, um, but they allow for communication with the external environment and other cells. Um, and some of the proteins also allow um, one cell to bind with other cells. You can also see that some of the other functions are listed in these diagrams here. So we've got the transport, we can see how these pass through there. Um, they help with enzyme activity, provide the signals, um, recognition, um, and then like we said, uh, the with other cells. Uh, when we refer to the phospholipid, we're talking about this molecule on our right here. So um, it, a phospholipid is a long chain fatty acid. Uh, so the little yellow lines that are off 
um, the phosphate head. And so the phosphate part of the molecule is hydrophilic, so it loves water, and the long chain fatty acids are hydrophobic, so they actually don't like water. The cell membrane allows both active and passive transport to occur uh, for the cell. So when we have active transport, the proteins, which we looked at earlier, um, bind with the molecules which we want to either transport in or out of the cell and carry them through that membrane. Um, like we said before, active transport does require the expenditure of energy, um, but sometimes these substrate molecules activate the protein carriers um, and allows them to move through where they might have been previously excluded. And when we talk about passive transport, we're talking about no energy being required. So things like water, oxygen, carbon dioxide and other small islands um, can diffuse freely through the membrane. So diffusion, like we mentioned before, is a passive movement of molecules and they move from a region where the concentration of these molecules is high uh, to a region where the concentration is low. Um, and this passive process is allowed to occur because of the difference, which we refer to as the concentration gradient. Some of the factors which affect diffusion is, again, the concentration. So if there is no uh, gradient, there is no diffusion. But again, if the gradient is large, the faster the rate of diffusion. Um, in temperature, so uh, higher the temperature, higher rate of diffusion. And then we refer to particle size. So the smaller the particles, the faster they will diffuse. So here we can see here. Um, on the left side, so A, we can see how the molecules were in one section. So that was um, between the left and the right, there was a high concentration uh, gradient. Um, and so we can see that eventually over time they've diffused and they become evenly distributed. So there is no longer a gradient. And again, on the right side, we can see um, if the concentration outside the cell is greater, they will move in to balance that, um, that difference in concentration. There is another type of diffusion which we refer to as facilitated diffusion. And this is where um, the molecules, again, there's no energy being um, expended here, but they, the molecules which are be, uh, diffusing require, are required to move through the channel proteins in that membrane. Um, so there are specific proteins for spe um, specific particles which need to move through. So we refer to this transport as being selective. Um, the transport in this is more rapid by simple diffusion. Uh, so sometimes these transport proteins uh, can all become full and um, as the concentration of the transported substance increases and sometimes uh, the transport of one particle might be inhibited by the presence of another particle um, that does require the same transport protein to be used. We're now looking at osmosis and this is the net diffusion of water molecules uh, but this occurs across what we refer to as a semi-permeable membrane. So the water moves from a diluted to a concentrated solution along its own concentration gradient. So we can see that on the left, we can see all the water molecules and we can see um, in the middle, we have a sugar solution. If we put those into the same uh, container in a semi-permeable membrane, we can see on the right here, this diagram, the purple line is the membrane, and we can see that the concentration of the water molecules on one side is different. Um, so we can see that the water molecules are going to move uh, from where they're in a high concentration, so what we refer to as a dilute sugar solution, so there's lots more water molecules, uh, to where the, there is a concentrated sugar solution, where there's a lot more sugar molecules as um, opposed to water. Another type of active transport or a type of active transport um, we're moving away from the passive transport now is what we refer to as endocytosis. And it's where large molecules are transported across a membrane. Um, usually these molecules are enclosed in a vacuole or a vesicle um, and then they're discharged on the other side. So there's three types. There's pinocytosis where the material transported is a liquid. There's phagocytosis, where the material transported is a solid, and it's receptor mediated, where the molecules have to bind to a specific receptor site on the membrane called coated pits. Here we can see how the three different types we just talked about. So phagocytosis, where that uh, large solid molecule is moving, and then we can see pinocytosis and the receptor mediated. 
And our final slide is just a bit more meta language, and it's when we talk about our concentrations. So uh, we can use three different words to describe the solution concentrations. So isotonic is the word we use where there is um, the solutions both inside and outside a cell are the same. So the concentrations are the same. Hypertonic is where there's a solution of lower concentration than a cell. And hypertonic is where there's a solution of higher concentration than a cell. So um, we're talking about not the cell itself, but the, the solution which is surrounding the shell, um, the cell which regulates the way in which water will move either into or out of the cell, depending on the solution which um, is around it. Thanks for watching lesson three. Make sure you tune in for lesson four.